I remember as a child how different it is. Um, I grew up in the Philippines, and for those who probably ha have an idea of the Philippine history, um, in 1985, there was a crucial period in our history. And I can still remember, I was nine, and huddled in our living room, I was watching on TV together with my mom, my brother, who's a year older, and my grandma. All four of us were just watching on TV, and we were watching history happen in the Philippines. That was the EDSA revolution, where hundreds of Filipinos, nuns, priests, went to the streets to just topple a dictatorship that has been there for 21 years. I didn't know that at that time, I'm nine. I was just like, why are they so fascinated with this? Why isn't there any other things in TV, you know? It's just the things that you see. But I saw how my mom, my grandma, how they were so affected by what they were seeing. There were tears in their eyes when finally, finally the dictator fled. There were cheers in the streets, people wearing yellow, and there was just so much things going on. For a nine-year-old, you wouldn't see or think of such an invitation. But that was a movement rising. And as an adult, I am so proud, you know, so proud to know that that was part of our history. That there was a bloodless revolution that happened. And it pains me to know that the current administration in the Philippines is shrugging it off. And that a lot of young millennials do not see the same thing as I do when it comes to this revolution. And this, you know, is a movement that has happened. 1985, how many decades ago? And during that time, we can only see those through what? Newspapers, TV, radios. But now it's a different generation. Now movements are steering and firing up just by a click of a button, and just by your phone, just by reading, looking at Facebook, looking at what is posted in Instagram. And this, I would say, is where social media should be. Social media should be a platform where movements are being raised, where steering changes needs to be followed. And this is where now, I would think of, you know, this is such a big luxury for us to be able to connect with each other, to be able to know what's going on, and to be able to touch lives. And this probably is the biggest question that I would like to ask you. you know, when you post, when you share something, how are you contributing to a change? How are you contributing to a shift? How are you steering a movement? And they say movement comes in four different stages. One is, you know, you have a situation where uh, you begin to question things, like what happened with the Me Too campaign. And then you mobilize your resources. And then you look for solutions. And then lastly, a movement is accepted when the status quo is changed. So when you post, I would like to invite those of you who are here to think about it. When you click on send, like, or a picture, think about it first and, and really check in with yourself. What change am I steering by liking this post, by sharing this post? What movement am I embracing, am I sharing by sharing this information with others? Because the Me Too campaign if probably, you, you know, for those who have really talked about it, there was, there was quite a lot of backlash with it. It was not just a simple thing, because there was collective grief and <coughs> anger that happened. So the next time, you know, that you post, my invitation is to think about it. What is the collective feeling that you would want to, to steer? What is the movement that you are trying to change? And with that, thank you very much for listening.
everybody who are present here. My dear co-speakers, my soul sisters of WBF, my warm and respectful regards to all of you. I am Shukti Roy, I am from India and I feel greatly honored to have been invited here to say a few words at The Hague on the International Women's Day on the topic Harnessing Social Media for Community Action. The world that we live now is a global village in the true sense of the term. As my co-speaker Lana has already explained that it is only a click of a button that unites the entire globe from the far east to the farther west, from Africa to Latin America, from Arctic to Antarctic. Now, on based on this reality, when we talk about the topic harnessing social media for community action, it really has a multi-layered dimension. Before going straight into the topic, let me try to define what is social media and what do I understand by the word community. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, social media means forms of electronic communication such as websites for social networking and microblogging through which users create online communities to share information, ideas, personal messages, and other content such as videos. If we try to surf the internet to find the meaning of the community in respect to social media, it comes to regular users of the social media apps on the mobiles, tabs, and computers. But I am here to take the word community in the broadest sense of the term. I find community to be the huge chain of human beings in every corner of the world to whom we can reach out with the ideas of a more equal society where every human being would be equal and the woman would really comprise half of the firmament. I don't want to talk elaborately about the Me Too movement because it has already been discussed in the exhaustive um, words of my co-speaker Lana. But one thing is to think about that when I was small, when I was in my school days, often teachers asked which day is called the International Women's Day? Some of us raised our hands to say it's the 8th of March. Not everybody was aware of the day which now almost in every part of the world women know how. One of the reasons is the social media. Those of us who possess a smartphone from the very early morning, I have been getting messages wishing well for International Women's Day. Greetings. And also, I have been receiving the videos and messages that why to celebrate one day as the International Women's Day. Every day is International Women's Day. So, there are different logics, different ways of thinking that are shared, that are imparted by the social media. One of those movements which, were, which created a tremendous effect on the human psyche was the Me Too movement. When we stand for equality and we stand for mm, the empowerment of a woman, I think that the most valuable resource of the human civilization is information, knowledge, and experience. 
Information heaps up with every new happening on earth and it can contribute to knowledge when it has a large scale import and it thrives only when it is passed on from one generation to the other from one community to the other when knowledge information and experience mingle what we get is wisdom with harnessing of social media i think the process of transforming information storing knowledge has gone up in a large extent the easiest way to establish it is the fact that any information brisk or even to some extent detailed one goes to internet search engines like google before entering a library or looking for an encyclopedia nowadays the knowledge and experience can be passed at a striking speed to all parts of the world as a raw material for individual or community wisdom what is, that this is what makes me hopeful when i think that harnessing the social media one day not far off the women across the continents would raise their voices against domestic violence against female feticide and female infanticide which is prevalent in many countries i'm sorry to say of my own where i come from the movement a fight against sexism can gain a tremendous momentum in this way with the exchange of ideas exchange of concepts and exchange of experiences the movement on different issues as equal wage or salary for equal work or opposition of gender based discrimination and harassment in workplaces can become stronger in this way social media can have an effective role to play on the issue of emancipation of women in a changed and advanced society <clears throat> it cannot be denied that all liberty begins with economic freedom in this web bound world social media can initiate a way for economic freedom particularly for those women who otherwise might lack the situations to earn their financial liberty by going out of their homes starting from homemade food items to cost effective jewelry writing scripts for plays to translation women can create earning opportunities for them and reach out to others through facebook whatsapp or such windows of social media i know hundreds of women from my country who are running online business of their own with with very little investment many of them had shared it with only a little bit of curiosity but now are earning quite well and have been able to contribute to an elevation to their family lifestyle leading to elevation of their own power and prestige or to support their single existence to defend their honor and dignity from abuses that she had been tolerating for years only because she found no other way to support herself in the internet age when the actual world and the virtual world merge to create a contemporary world one particularly a woman can find mental support from a friend in social media at a time of crisis from somebody who might be facing or might have overcome the similar situation as in actual world there are false friends and advantage mongers so are they in the virtual world as well and therefore one has to be careful particularly when it comes to money or close physical intimacy but still coming to know more ideas and experiences may prove to be important from very as every aspect that would be the best effect on community action i would like to conclude only with these words that in every age media could be converted into a tool of protest and propagation starting from printed media to cinema and television and now 
With the social media, women's movement can be stronger and sharper only if the women have the orientation, foresight, and skill for that. Thank you very much.
that our institutions are built on. And it's difficult and frustrating sometimes but when we shove a woman into a position, does she have the resources to be the best she can be in that spot? Is there family planning from that career? Does she have something to help her when somebody sexually harasses her at work or speaks down to her because she's a woman? All of these things, while we are saying, yes, we want women in science and more women in science, there's this undercurrent that is really harming uh, our way forward. So we've been trying to tackle that at the bottom. Um, it's, it's difficult. But what we found is that if we start at a small scale in our local communities, we can work better. So what that means is we have a leadership that's international, and we have 15, about 15 women who think about what are the broad concepts that we want to change in our community, and we meet every two weeks. But we also have local chapters, and that is each city, about each city or university area has groups that have come together. We now have over 150 um, chapters, totaling over 4,000 women that are active today. And so this means that they're meeting in, in um, so in my community in Bafaniga, we had our meeting last week, and we said, what are we doing this year? And this year we're gonna have a mentor night where we're doing speed mentoring and inviting women from around the Netherlands to come speak about their life in science and give an example to the different, different um, career phases that we have in our group. But um, in Philadelphia, they're really into politics. So they've been meeting with their local um, government officials to talk about how they can be representatives for science. So after all of this work, we now we have a really big community. Uh, we're on Twitter all the time with 15,000 followers and 10,000 Facebook followers, which is great. I mean, it's science, so we're kind of focused, but we're, it goes beyond science. These are questions and values that I think are valued everywhere. One last final thing that we developed recently, which we're really excited about, and if you think, I really need a scientist to talk to about this, and I want them to be a woman, we have a platform for that now. It's called Request a Woman Scientist. And so you can search, yeah. We have now over 5,000 women who have signed up. If you have a, a scientist friend, if you're a scientist and want to sign up, you can sign up. If you're a journalist or are somebody who needs a scientist to ask a question for or want them on your panel, you can go to our platform and search by country or by discipline and contact those people. So um, these are all the ways that we've used social media to grow our network. And along the way, we're finding that it helps to partner. So I've loved being here this week because there's all of these groups that are doing things that I'm like, oh, we think that's really important. Let's work with them. How can we think of ways to work together to amplify these really necessary voices? Um, and a final example of what we've been doing is, and this has come up a lot today, is giving a voice to women and showing that it's okay to speak up and talk about these important topics. And so one example, a few, about a, yeah, a few weeks, months ago, um, with the presidential address, there was a, a popular scientific celebrity in America who was going to this scientific address and he was going with, somebody who wasn't on the up and up. He was not a representation for science, but he said, I'm crossing aisles, we're gonna work together. And he's saying, I'm your representative for science. And we looked at him and we said, hmm, you're not my representative for science. You may say you're a scientist and may, people may see your glasses and your white face and your white lab coat and say, you look like a scientist, but you don't look like me and I'm a scientist. So we wrote an article about this and uh, a lot of people really liked our article and we said we need to change the face of science and we need different representation for who, who says, I'm a scientist, I represent all scientists. And I think this idea that having one person or one idea of a person represents all of us, I mean, it's everywhere, everyone's talking, we're like, yeah, I know that. It's like that when you close your eyes and you think of what a doctor looks like, are you picturing an old man with a... Beard, like that, that aim, like it's the same is true in a lot of professions. And it doesn't mean that those people aren't also doctors and scientists, it's that we have to change our biases and our perception of, of who that person is. Um, and so anyway, so we wrote this article, it went online and it went totally viral and people were angry. There was a lot of angry people who said, don't take away our celebrity scientists, we love our nerd. Like I love nerds too, I'm a nerd. But I think more of us, um, deserve a voice out there. And so we've been using social media to change the dialogue and show that it's okay to speak up. That's it. Yeah. So now we have time for questions. Yeah. Um, thank you.
thank you all. Uh, so I have a, a comment and a question. Um, the comment, it, I really uh, appreciate hearing you know, the positive and, and a lot of the way that you were phrasing how important it is that we each think about the potential good that any social media click can do, how powerful that can be. And I think it's, it's particularly uh, important to hear now because we've been seeing social media used in very evil ways. Uh, a lot of those elections you talked about being influenced by you know, paid influencers with a particular uh, agenda. It, so insidiously, where you know one person would see on Facebook an ad not realizing that it was directed to discourage them from going to vote, for example. Um, so my question is, you know, women scientists, how can we stop this? You know, do you have computer scientists um, who, who could help with this? It, it, because it doesn't sound like anybody is able to stop it at the moment. It's, it's a huge issue. Oh, yeah, that's such a good question. I do not have like a good science answer for that. <laughs> because, because, yeah, I've been listening. I, I've been trying to educate myself on this um, in the last, especially the last like month has been like, okay, we really need to pay attention to this. From my, like our group, our organization's perspective, we are all about, yeah, we use a lot of social media to contact people, but really it's those on the ground contacts and getting yourself into the community and talking to people, that doesn't answer your question though, because it's so insidious and so many people are being persuaded by their Facebook feed. But that, yeah, I think that we just can't let up and, and be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can't let up and we can't be lazy and say, oh, we posted this important scientific result on social media, but actually you have to get out there and have conversations mm -hmm and go to your city hall where people are voting on things and incur and educate people in a way, like starting early. I think even starting, it's never too early to start talking about like, what is what is fake news or like mm -hmm. where are people, uh, yeah, when it, how often do we use an encyclopedia anymore? <laughs> I mean, like in, I did in school, I had a book reports where you go to the library and you have to find real information and now you don't have to do that. So at what, you can go to Google and, at what point do you say, that's enough, no, let's find real information and how do you find real information? And actually, that's something cool about being a scientist. Like, I'm trained to research and find the information that's as real as possible, but that training is not reserved for just scientists. Everyone can learn how to do that, which is lovely, yeah, right? And I think that's just such a wonderful thing and why we think science is more just a platform for diplomacy and for sharing information, not that it's scientists versus non-scientists. Mm -hmm. I'll answer that from not just from a, a, an educator point of view, but also as a parent point of view. I remember the time when my son was watching something on his iPad, and I was shocked. I was like, what are you watching? And I looked at the iPad, and of course, it was porn. He's seven. And I was stumped, and I looked at history, and I saw how the progression was. Look, my, my son has a high IQ. He, he was diagnosed, or what diagnosed, he was, he was tested, and he has a, a high 145 IQ. So I looked at what the history was, and it started with Bill. Uh, if you're Dutch, you probably would think he was looking for butt pictures, something that's funny for a seven-year-old. But when you look at pictures that says Billa, but you would see porn. And from one click to another, you see the progression. And that was when I realized that the conversation needs to start as early as possible. And it needs to start at home. So that time, me and my husband, we really sat down and said, look, social media will not go away. Not at all. You know, we, we grew up in, in that generation where we didn't have phones where our parents can call, where are you? You know, that we can still, um, oh, what's this, go out of school, you know, skip classes and not be, you know, not be looked at in the app of wh where is your destination. But this is different. This is a different generation. And social media is not leaving, going away. And what I realized as a parent, as an educator, is we really need to start those conversations going in at home. So how do you talk it out with your partner? You know, um, one of the things that 
we did, be, you know, and we're still doing that, is we have limited technology time with our kids. And it's not because we're trying to take something away from them, but it's also for us to encourage them to, look, there are other ways of doing things. And if you just look at your TV, your PlayStation, your, they don't even have phones. My, my, my kids are nine and 10, they don't even have phones. But if we start these conversations, then we get to also have an answer of what is possible for us. You know, what is it that you value as a family? So this perhaps is one way to look at it, to start that conversation. And I'm also hoping to see the conversations in schools, that we can orient um, not just not just children, but also the teachers. You know, how do we teach children to look for data, for example, uh, and not just rely on Google? Uh, I I sat with my with my son while he was doing his uh, his video presentation, and he said, "Mama, it's just so easy. You just type in Google what that information is, and then you just copy and paste." And I was like, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is what they're being taught in school." So perhaps this is also the, the next question, you know, not just from the family level, but going out to broader society. How can schools adjust their policies so that in, in my kids' school, they even have during lunch breaks, they would watch TV, well, in essence, a video. And it's not something, you know, relevant to what they're, they're doing. It's just something to spend time. So it's questioning that, you know, is this really relevant? Is this really important? You know, is this something that we can change? And then lastly, for us as well as adults to monitor how we use technology. Uh, my kids, they're, they're good police. They would say, Mama, why are you using technology? I have an excuse. I would say, look, I'm answering messages. It's for business purposes. But I can always do that, especially when they see, Mama, that's Facebook. So, <laughs> So the next question is, how do you yourself, you know, manage your use of social media? Um, and you know, and I, we've, we've consciously thought of, okay, taking away our, our community of, for entrepreneurs out of Facebook because it's not contributing to the discussion. How can we do that? You know, how can we uh, evaluate how we use social media in our lives and say, okay, this is relevant for me and take out the rest that isn't? It's interesting, actually, nowadays that a lot of people are taking out Facebook in their phones. Yeah? It's, it's very interesting because there was such a surge of having Facebook, and now more and more people are taking it out because of it. You know, they notice it. It's an addiction. So how do you evaluate that as well? Um, me and my husband, we, we try as much as possible to have a no-phone policy in the bedroom. And that this is where change when it comes to social media can happen. Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to answer your question in a little broader perspective. When we were small, we were in our schools, <clears throat> often we were asked to write an essay on the topic, whether science is a boon or a curse. Because the wars were going on, particularly in my country, and so many people dying because of the inventions of science that were being used in the wars. Second World War had seen the heinous um, discoveries and inventions of science that had killed so many people. Here, the topic we are discussing about is about harnessing the social media. That's why the question of harnessing comes. If left unleashed, even a matchstick can cause a havoc. So we have to harness. We have to choose. Um, once again, coming back to my college days, my elders and my teachers used to say, anything that is in printed words may not be true. That means through the media of printing, there were often misconceptions spread. But that couldn't be spread so fast as the social media does. So the question of harnessing, the question of choosing, and the question of applying good logic is very relevant in this case. Like every invention, we have to use this social media also in a, 
in a limited manner so that it is beneficiary and the harmful side has to be dealt with a lot of care as we you, we talked about it when we wrote our essays on the topic whether science is a boon or a curse any more question a scientist too <laughs> and I totally feel where you're coming from and I was wondering if do you I know it's five hundred agreement scientists but how do you work with men because we can't yeah and the other thing the second point is as a mom as well I to, I went through the same um, physical emotions I didn't realize I'm not American but when I unfortunately I'm in I'm based in Hong Kong and I actually it was 3 p.m. when they called the election and we were so shocked, <laughs> almost like America, what, mm -hmm. WTF. <laughs> and as a scientist, I am an environmental scientist, I'm a climate scientist and economist by background, and I love science, and I grew up in, a, in an environment with a mom, my mom was a housewife, and she was the one who said, you can be whatever you wanted to be. So I wasn't intimidated by having men in my, in my classroom, so I found that odd. So as a mom, I decided that I would give the same experience to my daughter. So that when this whole Trump thing happened, the first thing that came into my mind the next day was, I, I feel totally helpless because I'm not American, but also totally helpless. But then I realized, as a mother, I can actually shape my children's future. And I, I, I told my husband, I'm sorry, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to go to the Great Barrier Reef because that's going to make me so much better. And that was like my way of teaching my kids, because as an environmental scientist, I wanted to see, I wanted them to see the science. I wanted them to actually see what they're going to lose. And so I'm, two questions is really, how do you work with the men? And second, what are you doing about the next generation? How are you going to get more women into science and them not getting intimidated by getting into this field? Yeah, great questions. Uh, intimidation is hard for, hard for everyone, um, especially in a field where you're like, you have to be the smartest to be here, but like, you don't really have to be the smartest, you just have to really like science. Um, so for men, so we created a, a, an organization for women, by women, but that does not, I mean, the values that we, our organization stands for is cross, cross genders, cross country, cross everything, right? Um, we want women to be the leaders because often in spaces, um, there are, it, there are more men than women, so the women's voices are not as loud. But, and our leadership board is only women, but our advisory board has men on it. And we have um, our like activities, we invite everyone to participate. So we like, it's more, um, yeah, that part actually, that's been really nice to have that and listen, and then having our advisory board weigh in and like they're on the same page. What has been a challenge is, um, ally, finding allies and people who think they're allies, whether they're men or women, um, they think they're an ally. They're like, I'm an ally to this cause, to women, to people of color, to LGBTQIA, and then they don't know how to be an ally. So something that we've been working with like lots of different groups on this is how can someone be a better ally? How can I be a better ally to people of color? How can um, my male colleagues be a better ally to me in my office when they make jokes? like? Should I say something to them or like so it's we're we're really exploring this. I think it's a new conversation and one that's taking place a lot on social media. And so I choose to follow people who are leading the way in this. Um, they're both men and women. There are really uh, there are really some great people that I follow that are scientists, that are social activist scientists, that are men and women. So I follow them and listen to them and learn from them. And it's something that I I have to work on every day and. Yeah, that's, that's not a great answer. It's not like there's one thing for that, but um, yeah. And then, uh, what was the second part? What's Getting more young, young women, women. Yeah. 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 You know what, actually, it seems like the more that we are out there representing ourselves as scientists, a uh, woman in science, the more like we're seeing young girls and you're like, I want to be a scientist too. Um, and I think that is that is what we're doing. And that's like getting changing the face of what a scientist looks like 
um, take, and that's awesome, you took your kids to a place to be like, this is the environment, and you can study this, this is, sci this is what like, science goes into, like mm -hmm. understanding the mechanisms behind these things. And so then the next part of that is finding scientists that are not the norm, or finding, don't, finding um, somebody who you don't think as, oh, they're not a scientist, but like your local doctor woman, like is she, you know, asking her about her medical background and asking about science and showing that, um, giving examples, like real life examples, I guess I would say. Um, there's some really good books out right now too about women scientists that history has forgotten. And there's a couple of ones that are like coloring books and like more children friendly ones, especially. I mean, I really like them. I have a few. <laughs> so, yeah. And Barbie also released the NASA. Yeah, 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 stuff like that. I, yeah, I actually, I'm not concerned about the the future women, young scientists. I'm more concerned about what we're leaving them yeah. more than anything. Yeah. Well, it's uh, actually a comment. I have two sons, and I so recognize the, the bit of book. <laughs> this, it's anecdotal. Uh, I have also a pro, he's studying in Wageningen. <laughs> and he was looking up the word Willem Cook because he likes cooking. And he thought that butt cook cookies were something to make. But actually, it's the Dutch word for spanking. So he was looking Willem Cook. And then he came on the same sort of sites. So that's a sort of reasoning <laughs> that a seven-year-old, or six-year-old in this case, does. But that was not my point. <laughs> my point is, I'm trying to raise my boy kids to be uh, good partners to women. And we're here in a sort of women environment and uh, have these wonderful ideas about how to be an example for uh, kids, women, female kids. And let's not forget our boys. So I taught them to cook. One of them is, is actually learning food technology <laughs> in Wageningen. And the other one hates cooking, but he has to. <laughs> he must. I'm, I'm trying. Uh, we're trying, my husband and I, we're trying to make them good partners, respectful of their, uh, well, their partners. And uh, that's something I sort of miss in this uh, <laughs> environment. And I would like to stress, if you have sons, make them good partners. <laughs> or educate them to be partners. And what kids do is they parrot they or they mock, how, how do you call it, they, they, they mimic. They mimic what their parents do. Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> and if you're giving uh, not a good example, they just mimic that. It's, it's what they see. So my husband and I try to raise uh, responsible adults. And uh, I think we did a pretty good job. <laughs> but I want to stress that, um, that that's also something that mothers mainly, because they are the bearers of culture. And not as much as men, but mothers are the bearers of culture. So change happens with women. Also, the change that you want to give. Well, as an example, the male population. So that's it. Um, I, I would like to just comment on a quick one. Oh, sorry. I, I, I really like the emphasis on, on men uh, and also boys. Um, what I do with my son is sometimes, you know, when, when we're cuddling and I was saying, oh, I, I saw a very good film, let's watch it together. And normally it's something that is social or political. So uh, a few days ago, there was this film about how is it that uh, women feel that they are not good enough, while, whereas men are so confident, even if they're not that skilled in a specific position. So I showed him that film, and I didn't, you know, I didn't say anything after. And, and like I said, you know, now, he's, now he's nine. Um, and I just listened to his dialogue, and he said, 
Mama, I'm not like that. And I don't want to be like that. If I don't, you know, if I don't know something, I would say, look, I don't know it. I wouldn't pretend that I'm, you know, I'm very much confident about it. So for me, I was like, oh, you know, just, again, harnessing social media is that, you know, looking at what films, what videos, what, uh, what, what uh, prompts that you can steer in the discussion and then adding it as part of the conversation. So he likes that, you know, he likes that I show him films about, uh, you know, femi uh, feminine movements. Um, it, it's exciting, you know, it's exciting to see having a, this new generation of boys. But another part of it is also including your partners in the conversation. After the Me Too movement, I talked with my husband and I said, look, your voice is very much needed right now. Because us women, we can scream all we want and say, look, me too, me too. But it's the men who goes side by side and say, I hear you, I acknowledge you. And this is something that needs to happen as part of the conversation. How can we get men to say, I, you know, I am part of this conversation as well? I, just, I, uh, I was listening to an interview with Gloria Steinem and she said, we're all in a prison from this gender imbalance. Men just often have the nicer furniture and maybe a few nicer clothes in the prison than the women do, but we're all in the prison together and it's important to keep that in mind. And so as we break down the gender imbalance, we are released from the prison, all of us. And there's lots of examples I'm sure we have from our own communities where men suffer from the gender imbalance. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, Unfortunately, I missed the Me Too thing. I wrote, actually, I wrote an article about the Me Too because I also was, um, well, how do you call it? A victim? More time, multiple times. And one of the things that I think, I see some men here, hi. <laughs> Four. Uh, one of the things that I stress is the bystander approach because men do not listen to women when they're between men. They do listen to each other. So when they hear, um, how do you call it, uh, ins insults uh, regarding women, they have to stand up. So I'm addressing the man here. So when you're in your sports, sports club or at the bar and you hear awful things about the C word for women, the B word for women, Please say, if you, if you have the same in, uh, opinion, please say, I do not agree. I don't like what you're saying. Because I can say I don't like what you're saying, but I'm not listened to in that um, so-called happy environment. Yeah. But men listen to each other more than they listen to women. So I, I urge you mm. to sort of, um, well, was that? Yeah, yeah. Bu building better allies. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to do that? I'm sorry, are you Maybe it's because I'm young and naive, but uh, don't underestimate your voice. Like, it's not just because you wouldn't be heard. I think in my case, if it would be against a man, if it would be against a woman, my reaction would be the same. If something in just happened, then I would speak against it. It doesn't matter which gender you are. So I think if you say, oh well, something bad happened to a woman, you should speak up. If something bad happened to a man, you should speak up. It shouldn't matter that you're a woman or a man because then you're already differentiate yourself. So just trust in also in what you have to say. And I think if you if you stand up and say, no, this is my opinion, also men will listen to your thing. So they're not always that strong. <laughs> they might seem so, but they're not. I have great hopes for the next generation, but I'm, um, uh, I think that the younger generation is more open and more but my experience is that men my, in my age group, um, 
laugh things away. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. They, they're like, oh, it's a joke. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not that serious. Don't be a spoiler. It's not that serious. Of course you're not black. <laughs> of course you're not... Uh, of course you have brains. Uh, it's, it's laughed away. But when... A, that's that's my, what I see. And I do really trust um, that are, there are men like you, like yourself, that are, um, are speaking up when they see injustice. And don't, and, they, and probably you won't laugh it away, but that's my, what I've encountered, unfortunately, many, many times. So, that's... Uh, so, we have one last question. Well, I don't really have a question, but a comment. I was uh, reflecting on what you said, Lana, about uh, the power of the Me Too movement and the power of social media and the idea that it can be a good or a bad thing, like everything else. So if we have this big power now that's been given to us to communicate with all the world, to steer a movement, to get together, because the Me Too movement is that, put, brought together women in a common um, topic in a common rage also and so we for example I have this conversation with my husband as well um, we discussed about it we cried and, and I told him and even if it's a very open fantastic man he didn't realize that, uh, that how big the problem is and we have a daughter and I say okay you have a daughter you know that this will happen to her how are you feeling about that? So the, the movement that the started with social media also had the power to bring conversation at home, a conversation with our kids. So we have this big power that can be used for good, but also for not so good. If we spread fake news, every time we share something without knowing what we are sharing, that makes me crazy. Uh, I love science, I'm not a scientist, but I love the scientific method, I lo love research, and every time I get a news, I always research before sharing, is this thing true? Is this backed up? And I see a lot of friends sharing any kind of news and then it's fake news. You're using this power thing to share lies. So this is in our hands, in our smartphone to be the agents of change and say, I want to use this smartphone in a very conscious way. So before sending share or, or posting, I will, be ma I will make sure that I'm sharing good information, helpful information, so we can use what we have in, in a good way instead of using for destruction and for spreading lies. That's my, that my hope that we can also teach our children that Google is fantastic, Wikipedia, Wikipedia is my hero, we have uh, all these amazing possibilities, but we need to use them for good. Thank you. Thank you. Nature has created men and women as counterparts. So one cannot be complete without the other. In my country, the education of women flourished with the consciousness of men, <coughs> like Raja Ram Mohan Rai or Shachari Vindbin Dasvigar or Rabindranath Tagore. Because earlier, the women were not allowed to study. It was believed that if a woman, woman goes with books, she is destined to become a widow. And I think if women make half of the sky, the rest half men make. And together, the world can be a better place to live, a better place to raise up our children. That's all.